Let me add my voice to those who have already spoken to welcome each one of you. Uh, we're so glad that you're here. And uh, also want to invite you to come back and worship with us anytime that you have the opportunity to do so. Today I want to talk about a more practical subject uh, than I have been dealing with and the idea of communication and training. And I want to begin by reading from Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. It says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority and let no one disregard you. I have, uh, this will be the, actually the last one in a series of lessons in an effort to motivate and encourage us to do even better than we do in carrying out the Lord's work. Uh, I talked about being uh, love being the motivational power behind the kingdom of God. You know, other motivational principles like uh, duty or fear will serve us for a while. And, and they may be good for us to have for a period of time, but they will eventually fail, and so love has to take the place of those. And in the second lesson, I spoke about how to understand God's love and how that love can work in us, motivating us to do works that are very difficult and sometimes not at all pleasant to do. In a third lesson, I investigated the source of that love and how our worship assembly and our fellowship increases that love. This is when we approach it with the right attitude. And in the fourth lesson, I talked about finding joy in serving God and use Jesus and men like Abraham and Moses and Paul as examples of men who found joy in their service to God. And the only way you can understand joy is in serving is to just do it. It's something you have to experience. In this lesson, I want to talk about communication and training that will help us to carry out the work of the kingdom in a more efficient way. I am considering these two areas because they present a problem in every area of life from, from the most primary area of our individual homes all the way up to the United Nations. This being true, then it certainly would be a problem in the Lord's church and can hinder us in accomplishing our real purpose in life and that is to carry out uh, service to God, to serve God in the way that he wants us to do that. And if this is not your primary purpose in life as a Christian, then maybe you need to think, rethink your reason for being a Christian. Think about these two things from a personal point of view. How many times have you ever said about some work in the church, some event in the congregation, some need that has present, been presented, well now that's the first time I ever heard of that. And this was be after it had been in print and after it had been announced some and this may be true it may be the first time you ever heard of it maybe it shouldn't have been the first time you ever heard of it uh, but sometimes it is the first time you hear about something and and then again think about it in the second sense ever been asked to do a certain job in the church and say well I just don't know how to do that I'm not really comfortable in trying to do this because I don't really know where to start. Well, this is problems with communication and training. I don't expect to solve these problems with this lesson. They will never actually be solved because there are always continuing problems. But if we know and understand the better, then we be can begin to do better in our service to God because we understand the problems we're dealing with. Going back to what Paul wrote to Titus, 
in chapter 2 and verse 14, he said, who gave himself, talking about Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous of good deeds. And that's the kind of people we need to be because this is the kind of people God wanted and the kind of people God purified. So let's look first at the problem of communication. One of the major problems with elders and preachers and deacons and church leaders in general is motivating people to worship and serve in doing this is a failure to communicate adequately in the way that we should. Now we assume others understand things the same way that we do. And church leaders sometimes will be ready to plan a program. And they may spend several hours in uh, some kind of special meetings or maybe just in the regular meetings uh, discussing uh, what it is they want to do and planning and developing a church program and a project uh, for something that they want to do in a church. And then what happens? Well, I've seen this happen. It shouldn't happen, but then there's a brief announcement put in the church bulletin, and then it is announced on Sunday morning, sandwiched in between the sick and the afflicted, and then the leaders get up and say, well, why don't people want to support uh, our program? Well, sometimes the answer is simple. The members simply don't understand the importance of the program. They don't understand the urgency of it because the leaders have not communicated it well enough and long enough and good enough. Or they simply have not been trained to do the work that the leaders want them to do. And I'll talk more about that later. But if the idea is important enough, we should do special announcement, uh, maybe a, a more uh, thorough explanation of what the program is all about or what we're trying to accomplish. Not be afraid to repeat it over and over again and use every means of communication. It's called promotion. Uh, how many times do you sit down and say if you're going to watch a television program and you see a commercial and then back to back it'll come up and do it again. Uh, and you'll see that commercial five times in that program so you think I'm so sick of that commercial. I don't even want to ever see it again. But it got your attention, didn't it? You know what it's about. And then we maybe sometimes fail to use uh, uh, the way that people communicate more in our age, some of the electronic methods in which people communicate, and especially which our younger generation communicates with. So we need to take all these things into consideration. And I'm not pointing this at anyone or trying to be critical of anyone in this lesson. I fail to communicate as much as anybody else. It's a universal problem that we all face in various areas of our life. I'm trying to verbalize the problem so that we can deal with it better. I appreciate it when the elders take time to make special announcements. And sometimes I'm not in here. I, I, I think uh, Marvin made some special announcement this morning about something that he wanted to thank the congregation for. I got in just on the end of it, so I don't know what it was. See, it wasn't communicated to me, and for a good reason, I just wasn't here yet. Uh, but I appreciate when that happens, uh, and maybe it's concerning the budget, maybe it's concerning some special program, maybe it's just thanking the congregation. And I think the women also do an excellent job over in that class communicating things that the, the women all need to know or should know, and the prayer list that they put out and various other things. So it is not just communicators that have the problem, but just as often it is the hearers who have the problem, who are not hearing for any number of reasons. Maybe it's as simple as not paying attention, just you know, thinking about something else or doing something else whenever that communication is being made. Uh, maybe it's the people are just not interested. Or maybe it's as serious a problem as they have a hardened heart and they just don't want to hear about it at all. Uh, you know, and there's all kinds of things that hinder communication. You, you remember Jesus had all kinds of sayings that he said, he that adheres to hear, let him hear. And then he said things like, a hearing they do not hear and seeing they do not see. In other words, 
it was, it's not always the person who communicates. Sometimes it's a two-way street, and it's the people who are supposed to receive that communication. Reminds me of a, a story about my coworker in Minnesota that I worked with for several years, and uh, Pete Newtalk, and he was uh, from northern Minnesota, International Falls, as far as you get without falling over the line into Canada. And he was traveling down in the south, and uh, he had a, a very northern accent. He was traveling down south, the southeast part of the United States, and he had a flat tire, and he decided he, he had to fix it. He put on his donut, he drives to a place where he wanted to buy a tire, and I probably told some of you this story, but, but it illustrates it so well. So he's thinking, okay, with my accent, they're probably not going to understand me very well. So he's trying harder than he should have been. So he comes up and he says, I want to buy a, a tire. The guy looked at him and said, you want a what? He said, I want to buy a, a tire. The guy said, you want a what? And finally, he looks around, and he, and he sees a picture, and he says, I need a tire. And the guy says, oh, you want a tar. <laughs> so they just weren't getting, you know, that's, that was a hindrance in the communication. They just weren't getting it. But in, I've been speaking of uh, programs in general in the church so far. But this also applies to some very basic teaching benefits of attending Bible study and all the services of the church that we're able to do so. And I talked about that in an earlier lesson also. But we preachers tend to overuse verses sometimes, like Hebrews 10, 25, so I think not the assembly. Uh, and uh, the hearers sometimes don't get the full impact because we just use that verse and we don't use the surrounding area. And so they don't understand the benefits that they're going to be receiving by doing that or what they're going to be miss, missing whenever they don't. Have you ever heard the old saying, well, I can worship God in his creation better than I can in some church building. Now that translates into meaning my fishing boat or on the ninth hole of the golf course, usually. And... Uh, Right. And the contribution goes to the country club, and the fellowship goes to the fish. And beyond that, the Lord's Supper, which is only found in the assembly according to the scriptures, is missed. It's about fellowship and about a lot of other things involving our relationship with God. Now, Peter went back to fishing one time, and uh, after Jesus had been crucified and after he had been resurrected, and Peter takes some of the other, he just goes back fishing. And Peter meets him on the shore there of Galilee, tells him to fish a certain place, and they get this huge haul of fish. They've been fishing all night, hadn't had any luck. And they get this huge haul of fish, and they bring it in, and Jesus recognizes Jesus and comes in with the fish. And then Simon... Look, or rather, Jesus looks at him and he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? John 21, 17. It's time to make a decision whether you love me more than you love these fish you just drug out of the Gate of Galilee. So sometimes it's just decision time. Jesus pointed people to the Father and said, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. Speaking of the physical needs, not fish and golf balls. Uh, so there is a spiritual strength that comes from Bible study and from the assembly that comes in no other way. And this is hard to communicate because it has to be experienced and approach with the right attitude. You can communicate the need, but you cannot communicate the experience because it has to be felt by experience. Reminds me of a, when I was a new Christian living down in Enid, Oklahoma, and uh, the preacher got up and preached a, a lesson on attendance. And he really 
hit the congregation hard concerning that. And uh, there was an older couple who had grown up in the church. They had been faithful members for many years. They had attended every service of the church they possibly could, but they had gotten to the point where their health and vision and other things were beginning to fail, and they couldn't always make it on Sunday night. They couldn't make it in bad weather, and they couldn't make it sometimes just because of health reasons. They started crawling out of their pew and walking down front. And I thought of all the people in this church that should be repenting, this is the last couple that I can think of. And I sat there as a new Christian with tears in my eyes because of that. And the others were not getting it. They got it because their hearts didn't need to be, as we say in the song, softened with oil and wine. It was already soft. I'll never forget that. Now, I realize that we never fully accomplish our goals in a congregation. The goal to communicate so that every Christian, every member sees the need, sees the spiritual benefits, sees the responsibility uh, for the Lord, Lord's work, and they take that on in their lives. And I realize that sometimes love is, is a root, at the root of the lack of this problem, but that's no excuse for us not to do better in our communication. Communication is vital to the success of any enterprise, any successful enterprise. Let's go back in history. Take the Tower of Babel, for example. The people building the Tower of Babel were having great success, so much so that the Lord went down and looked at them and said, they shouldn't be doing this. They were having success in doing something that was not the Lord's will, and he wanted to stop. But he didn't use slash and burn tactics in order to stop that building. He simply stopped the communication by confusing their language so that they couldn't talk to each other. They couldn't communicate with each other. And so they just, this whole enterprise just fell apart. And then they scattered out on the earth and uh, did what the Lord wanted them to to begin with. So what's the real lesson here? The real lesson here is that lack of communication kills projects. It killed the work of the Tower of Babel. So communication is necessary for any successful enterprise, and we need to do everything we can to communicate better. And I need that. We all need that. And we need also to be on the receiving end of the communication to do better in that area, too. But let's move to the need for training. The second important area of motivation I want to talk about is that we need to train people for what they're called on to do. You see, the situation sometimes exists where the preacher gets up and he just, he just scolds the congregation in a sermon telling them uh, their duty, what they should be doing and what they should not be doing. It reminds me the, of a man who came into a congregation one time, first time he'd ever been there. And uh, he answers the invitation and the preacher comes over and he said, I think I'm a member of this congregation. And the preacher, preacher began to question him about why he thought that. And he said, well, you told the church that they should be doing a lot of things and they're not doing them. And you told them they should not be doing a lot of things and they were doing those things. So I figured out right away, I must be a member because that's with me. That's what I do. I don't do the things I should and I do the things I shouldn't. So I must be a member of this church. But often, the frustration comes from a sermon where the members are asked to do something and uh, they don't really know how to do it. They're not trained to do it. All people do not have the same ability and are only responsible for God, to God for what they can accomplish. Uh, most of us can start, of course, by attending the assembly. Uh, but this is no excuse for those who fail to learn because they simply don't want the responsibility or don't want to, to spend the time or the work that it takes to learn how to do the things that they're being called on to do or they maybe need to be doing. For a training program to be successful then, every Christian must be willing to be trained. 
to take the responsibility and spend the time and the effort it takes in order to be trained to do the things that God wants us to do. The point is this. It takes more than just telling people what must be done. Christians must be trained to accomplish God's work. I know this is not popular, but sometimes I think, uh, you know, if we take our classes sometimes with young people and split them up uh, into boys and girls and, and train them in the various areas of the Christian life that they can fulfill and the things that they can do in the Lord's work. And this sometimes is valuable for the adults too. So we need to train in everything from serving in the assembly, uh, not the people who've been serving for 20, 30 years, but those who maybe have not really started yet, and uh, public speaking and teaching and one-on-one -on -one evangelism, which reminds me that the Fishers of Men class will start on the 22nd of this month. And if you're interested in that class, please let me know. Communicate with me and say, I won't take that class. And if you have questions about it, so I can communicate with you and say, this is what it takes to take that class. You know, we are doing these things. We are communicating and we are training. But we need to do it even better. Uh, and we are commanded, actually, to train. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, it says he gave some as apostles and some as uh, prophets, some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the purpose of equipping the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the statue which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So we are told that this is part of our job is to train and to help people to do that which they uh, need to be doing. Now let me just take one area and deal with that for a minute. People need to be taught how to worship. And you think, well, what do you mean taught how to worship? People know how to worship. Well, one of the extreme is that people are doing everything under the sun, whatever pleases them, and calling it worship. And on the other hand, some people then are just attending worship. There's a difference between attending worship and worshiping. And I'm concerned about many who are attending. Now, for a visitor, this is not a problem. A visitor may just want to come in sit down in the church and say, I don't know what's going on there, so I'm just sitting here. That's fine. But for the members, that's a problem. Uh, we gather to sing and to pray and to teach and to give, take the Lord's Supper, and, uh, but these things are not our goal. This is not our goal in coming here. Our goal is to worship, to glorify God, and to praise Him because of what He has done for us. That's the real goal of our worship. If you stand closed mouth during the singing, visit with your neighbor uh, during the communion, put a bigger amount into the collection plate, uh, think about uh, who might be winning the next big game during the preaching, how in the world does that glorify God? My personal opinion is that some of my brethren are going back to the instrument and putting them in their worship services because they have lost the concept of worship and want to please themselves more than they want to please God. The emphasis then is more on performance then than it is on the heart, upon the worshiper himself or herself. Jesus' disciples were raised in the Jewish tradition. Uh, they were religious men who had worshiped all their lives or at least had been around those who do. And after watching Jesus pray, one of the disciples realized that he needed to know more. He was raised with prayer all of his life. The praying was something the Jews did. And in Luke 11, 1, it came about while he was praying, or while Jesus was praying, in a certain place after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. So you see John teaching his disciples how to pray. Now he's, this disciple is saying, teach us to do the same thing. Now notice that Jesus didn't say, well, if you'll raise your arms toward heaven. Or he didn't say, you better get down on your knees. You're not being humble enough. Or you need to get some people around you to yell amen a lot while you're doing that. Or anything else that had to do with performance. He didn't say any of those things. You know, he told them the things they needed to pray about, praising the Father's name. Uh, pray for the coming kingdom, for daily needs, for forgiveness. At the same time, you're forgiving the people uh, that you're praying for. 
and for freedom from temptation so as not to be led into sin. Notice what he says here. He said, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive our sins. For we ourselves all forget, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Now that's not a prayer to be repeated. That is an outline of the things that he's telling them they should have been praying for at that point in time. And so he's saying, you need to know how to pray. And they were saying, we need to know how to pray. So the point is that we may be born with the inclination to worship, but we are not born with a know-how to worship. That instruction must come from God. And we must go to the Holy Scriptures for instruction on how that we ought to worship God and what we need to do to please God. Now, let me draw this to conclusion. <clears throat> If we improve in these two areas, in communication and training, I believe we will be making progress in filling, fulfilling our obligation and desire to serve God as we should, as he really wants us to serve him and live for him. But before we can serve successfully, we do have to humble ourselves in obedience to his will. Uh, this is a command that Peter brought forth in 1 Peter 5, 6. He said, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. We approach God with humility. He does the exalting. He's the one who raises us up and shows us how important we are as his children. But he does that. It's not something we do. So what is your need today? Where are you? in your relationship with God. Do you need to become a Christian? Well, we can show you how to do that with the Holy Scriptures. Do you need to repent as a Christian? Maybe to rededicate your life to Jesus Christ and say, I just haven't been doing very well. I need to maybe get down here and rededicate my life and really get to work like I ought to do. If we can help you, then we will help you in any way that we can. And this is what we're here for. We all want to end up in heaven. I believe if you didn't want to end up in heaven, you wouldn't be here today. So we all want to end up in heaven, and we need to encourage and help one another along the way. So any way that we can help you in that journey, we will try to do the best we can while we stand and sing to encourage you.
we're letting our closing prayer, we'll sing from number 396, There's Not a Friend. <clears throat> There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No. day that you brought us here, that we're able to be with you and, and praise you. We're thankful, Lord, for Willis, for the messages he brings us, that he uh, tries to help us to understand and, and know how our Lord is, uh, wants us to live. Lord, we ask you to be with those of our number who are ill, who are in the hospital, who need an extra hand from you to bring them back to be with us so that they can join in our worship here with you. We ask that you guide and guard us throughout our lives. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>